have a ghost phone. <laughs> Just oh minute. shoot! Uh, hey man, um, are, are we going to talk about uh, on the show Elon Musk's bad weekend? <laughs> oh sure, sure. I mean, I mean, uh, you got today's. I don't know. I don't know this. Oh great, yeah. perfect. Okay, yeah. Rough weekend for old M Dog. A very wild timeline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this? Yeah. I'm gonna... I think one of them is really bad. The other half we need to know way more about. Yeah, yeah, correct. And and in fact, I want to speculate wildly. I want to I want to invent some conspiracy <laughs> theories on that, on that one. <laughs> yeah. Fucking. <laughs> wait, wait, what did he change his avatar to? Uh, this is uh, Edward uh, Elric. Ed Edward? No. Uh, it's one of the boys. This is the main character from Full Metal Alchemist. Ah, I got it. It's, uh, uh, it's pretty good. Meme Necromancer is a reference because he and his brother in the show uh, try to revive their mother using uh, magic, but they don't have the soul. And so she was like some horrible monster beast. Uh, and that's the show. It sounds like a. I have alternate. no idea what happened, and I'm so thrilled to get into it. Oh, <laughs> great! I, I, That'll be fun. Just knowing all these peripheral details, I'm thrilled. <laughs> yeah, I, I only know a little bit, so I'm excited. This is my, I'm excited to hear what. Uh, what went down online? Uh, I'll right. tell you the important. Twitter on my phone. I mean, uh, that's the biggest thing. Is I don't have Twitter on my oh, phone. Geez. This is uh, uh, more for Justin than anything. Before we go live or, or go on the show, mm -hmm. um, so apparently I wrote uh, my most successful tweet of the entire year over the weekend. <laughs> Did you oh, okay. see it? What was it? Uh, it was so I had the idea. Um, we were at the Renaissance Fair using the porta potty. And I realized, oh my God, what if you had those movie dollars and you just dropped a hundo in every one of these porta potties? That'd be the terriblest thing ever, right? And so I was like, I should tweet that, but oh, wait, maybe I'll do it actually. And so the next day, I was at the uh, property. And oh, so uh, I grabbed the movie, <laughs> the movie hundos, and I took a picture of that. And uh, uh, there was one person who responded snarkily, like, Oh, that's hilarious. It's funny because a poor person would reach in there for the hundred and then the poor person would uh, would not have a hundred dollars and you would have a cheap laugh. And I'm like, motherfucker, I wrote that tweet that that joke is tra crafted too perfectly. It's bulletproof. It's uh, because I specifically said at a music festival. So it conjures images of high and drunk, wealthy uh, uh, 20 somethings. So that sure. uh, uh, anyway. Uh, Your uh, idea of a on... music festival understood. <laughs> people online took what you said and mischaracterized it. Uh, great. Good no, thing yeah, you put energy Ryan, into that. Ryan, I understand. It's Twitter. There is no one uncancelable. Uh, well, well. It, it's when somebody tried that, I was just like, man, not today, Satan. This this joke is bulletproof. It's it's the perfect joke. It's one of the best things I've ever done. <laughs> Uh, no, that's amazing. And so it, w was it re responded to well? Yeah, like uh, 500 retweets and 3,000 likes and stuff. I like the that's... idea that you were going to music festivals. Well, okay, that that is the one. <laughs> Man, that's the exhaust port did on I, the Death Star. Uh, you I, motherfucker. 
I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, 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 my friends that go to music festivals aren't exactly all like rich, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> but also, it's just, just, just it, it is all very, very much back concert. It, it is very much proof. a luxury good, right? I mean, we all agree okay. with that. That's why it was phrased that way. We, we we did a thing on night. It's, I think it was in the after show or the pre show last, like literally last week, where it was the bit was what would need to happen for Brian to go to Coachella. Like, <laughs> correct? How we craft it in in the perfect Brian way that he. Would I'll tell you what. I th- I, I think we've made headway because uh, a friend of ours through the Wizard Academy, uh, David uh, Coachella. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, he uh, he runs the airport at Burning Man. So that mm. might be the way to do it. Uh, I don't know. It's not exactly a music festival, but but like as art, like that's how to get me out to Burning Man. Is if I'm gonna fly private, <laughs> land at the events, <laughs> you're gonna high five you, my buddy. You're gonna try to flex on the poorest music festival. <laughs> 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 the one just all about artists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. just an ayahuasca out in the oh, desert. Oh no, no, no. He would he would by no means be the uh, he would he would he would be the pleb. Uh, you know, flying private. To, oh, friggin' that, yeah, Ser- Sergey and uh, uh, the other one. <laughs> That's what they call themselves, right? Exactly. No, they. Oh, they... the Google guys. Yeah. <laughs> like Brian knows Russian people. Who no, 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 no. <laughs> like, like, like they're uh, they're apparently like they spend the a burning lot man. of money. Mm-hmm. At, uh, they're they are they are patrons yeah. of the arts. Apparently, there was a big thing a couple of weeks ago about um, Burning Man's permits for for future years, kind of in limbo. Um, cause of some, cause they have, it's, they get some federal permit, I guess, to use that land. Hmm. Um, that's, that, that's half of a news story, Bryce, remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. God, Andrew's back. Like, yeah, it's Ghost what Andrew. What? What's going on? Wait, is, oh. oh I like a video <laughs> from. I thought he walked away. And <laughs> oh, guys. Too. And then all of a sudden you hear the whispering wind. <laughs> Let me, uh. Do I need to shut some stuff down on my end, or? Uh, probably. I mean, I'm getting you guys are coming in beautifully. Yeah, yeah spin dash twelve. I think you're right. I, th- I think if I had made it specifically about Coachella, it would have been slightly. Ba- it would have it would have yeah. inoculated against that response. Hey, there he's, he's back. Oh, also, it, it's not like you were going to get that no matter what. Correct. Like, it was it was going to be a. You know. Everything on Twitter is about the thing that the person writing is the most cares the most about. Yeah. Uh, we're getting. Uh, we we see you again, but you've frozen. Uh, yeah, you're, you're still a little stuttery, Andrew. Uh, let me restart Skype. I don't know what's going on here. I've got a. Yeah, go for it. All right. I'm gonna shut down all my terminals too. Did, Dude, uh, did you guys watch the Beyonce Netflix concert doc from her Coachella thing last year? Was it called Shit's Creek or Game of Thrones? <laughs> if it's not, then I didn't see it this weekend. Uh, I am enjoying Barry more. Yeah? Oh, uh, it's, nice. it's much better as uh, I, I'm, I'm just all in on the Fonz uh, having sex with the detective. That's, uh, that's the whole show to me. I know what that means. Yeah, I don't. Okay. It's, sorry. <laughs> it's bad. Um, um, no, I haven't watched Barry yet. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll love it. Do, do, do you, do you like being told that acting is important? <laughs> do you like actors flexing their ability to act like people learning to be actors? I actually do oddly like that. For whatever reason, I've always enjoyed whenever somebody has to do a scene where they're acting badly. And then they start acting goodly. I, I, I do. I, I do as well. Uh, equally as much. I love when one actor portrays another actor's version of a, of a thing. Yeah. That's what I loved about like Birdman. It's like Birdman. It's, you know, there, there's when it's at, at the beginning and they're like showing like, oh, no, you're overacting. Mm. Uh, and it's like, oh, OK, well, I guess I did kind of detect that that was bad. Or did they just tell me it was bad? I don't know. The mysteries of acting. <laughs> it was like watching uh, David Copperfield talk with uh, Joni Spina when they were on stage, when I was working on as the runner for like their special. And they're talking about the proper way to close a door. And they're having an, a discussion about like, no, we need to do it like this. Well, how about this? Like, no, 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 this. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's much better. I'm like, I can't. 
I can't tell the difference, but I believe there is a difference. Yeah. And I think that's why David's on stage. And I'm like, who wants Burger King? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. It looks like you're back. It looks like you're good, Andrew. So if uh, if you're good to go. Thanks. Bro. No. All right. Then take it away, Andrew, in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by... Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. I'm back here uh, producing the show. Uh, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Good to be back with you. And Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hells yeah, dude. I uh, I felt the sneeze coming on. I had my mm-hmm. finger on the trigger, mm-hmm. and I, I covered my face, and I thought in the chess game, like, that, that was a rookie move. He's going to toss to me directly in the middle of the sneeze. But <laughs> was, you tossed to Bryce. I, like... I knew I was in the clear. I sneezed. It was great. There was that little, you know, the little, little poof, good Andrew, poof, evil Andrew, the little, <laughs> little, the angel and the demon were on my shoulders going, you know, Andrew, throw it to Brian, see what he does. Like, no, Andrew, that's the obvious one. Don't do that. Like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, well, the obvious one would be to throw it to Brian, but I'll be kind today and not throw it. And like, oh, Andrew, you're missing out again. <laughs> All in, you know, half a second of watching you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was just. Oh, man. Hey, man, so how about that uh, Elon Musk weekend? Oh, man. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's happened. For the- well, let's, let's start with there was some uh, CCTV footage from a uh, parking garage in China. And it shows a Tesla Model S. And then it shows it like kind of bursting into flames. Yeah, and and this is this is I believe a breaking story this morning as we're recording this on the Monday afterwards. So it's yeah. like by the other story, I don't know that it would merit anything uh, on on this show. But look at that, oh, God, right? That is straight up just a Tesla unprovoked bursting into flames. Yeah. Now, here's the thing: we don't know anything yet. Uh, it's an older Model S. Uh, could be, you know, when you you have it, could be could be genuine battery damage, and that's what caused it. Could be sabotage. Could be anything. It's it's hard to know exactly what the deal is because it is it is a company that's not without its faults, but it's also a company that's not without its enemies and short sellers and people who are like, hey. Let's put some pyro under here. Put this footage out, footage out there. Watch the stock plummet five. Well, and, and very it, quickly, it, the uh, I were just to watch it. And you were to not tell me that they were anything or say, oh, it was Elon Musk bad weekend. If I were just to look at that, I'd be like, oh, my God, that was a car bomb. That was somebody yeah. was blowing up a car. It certainly does uh, look like that. Uh, and very quickly, the, the, the Twitterverse was rife with conspiracy theories, uh, including the fact that China, whether it's the Chinese government or a Chinese uh, uh, company, was working on their alternative. Uh, it seems like that's a good time to. And it doesn't help that the number one tweet that everybody's seeing on this uh, has this stock ticker for Tesla as if to, you know, just say, so you all know what to do with your Tesla shares, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of these things. Let's just wait and get more information. Let's wait and get more information because we don't, we don't, there are so many, so many, there's the, you know, the motivations that we can imagine, the ones that we don't, and it'd be, could be damaged battery pack. Who knows? So, not a not a good day as a Tesla shareholder. <laughs> um, but uh, so that was when that's considered, you know, kind of a you know one of the things you're dealing with, uh, the headaches you're dealing with. Um, but the other one was uh, we had a had a over the weekend uh, SpaceX. There was rumor uh, rumor flew around that there was an anomaly on the test pad. For their had they took the crew, I understand for understand it was the crew dragon capsule they pulled out of the ocean, they put it on the test pad and they go through to do a series of tests. Well, let, let, let's see what the anomaly looks like. Here we go, Justin. Can you describe? All right, so it looks like the dragon capsule up there on a platform. Uh, oh my god, it <laughs> literally exploded. It's straight up as uh. I mean, as if it were itself intended to be a bomb. It looked like there were charges on it, and yeah. it just went off. <laughs> so, 
this was the this was the capsule. Apparently, I think the Scott Mann is reporting was a capsule that actually went into space, came back down, and they put it through to go through a series of tests. Because one of the things they want to find out about is saltwater corrosion, etc. Now, you look at this capsule. This is the the crew capsule. What you have on there is uh, a area to hold people inside of there. You've got support systems. The rockets there, they use uh, like like dihydrogen or uh, monazine, uh, hydrazine. There are a few different kinds of these exotic kinds of fuels they use because there are simple propellants that you can store. And what they do is they they there's there's actually how the, prop, the propulsion units work. Highly combustible, extremely extremely combustible. You know they can be a binary mixed with something. They can be when they get exposed to oxygen, whatever. You know, that's the thing. If we're looking at something exploding on there like that, chances are it's one of those propellants. Now, if it is a crew dragon, if it was the one, and apparently it was the one that they put out into space, came back down into the ocean, could be an issue of saltwater corrosion. You might have had a fitting or a part or something that, you know, you know. And so this is a setback. You know, they wanted to go launch this summer, which, you know, with people, and you, this might be a thing that only happens after it's gone through saltwater corrosion. We don't know yet. The, Why the you big, test? Here's the weird Why part test? is is – our very best scenario is that they find out it's because of Doug and something he did wrong. And he's like, ooh, totally forgot to seal that. Yeah. Anything other than that is uh, expect delays, ladies and gentlemen. Well, yeah, or, you know, it could be, oh, a test and equipment malfunction, too. You know, it could right. be there's, you know, things totally not. But, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't see how we're not going to have delays. You know, yeah. this is... Which, and again, like of all the components to have explode in the most fantastic of manner, the one called the Crew Dragon Castle. Well, and, uh, and is, that's one. That's one we got to be super safe on. You know, what? Boeing, Boeing Starliner had. We don't know what. We still don't quite know what happened to there. But, but Boeing Starliner, when they were testing it, they got delayed because they had a little explodey thing happen. Yeah, um, uh, and it, that wasn't one that went up in space. That was one a, a test item. Yeah, the uh, 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 this feels like. I mean, thank goodness nobody was hurt, but it's as from a progress standpoint, it's as bad news as when Apollo One went up in flames, you know, and and, and unfortunately we, we had three lives lost. I mean, it's significant whether there were people in there or not. Like this has to be safe. Yep, yep. I mean, there's sure. there. It's, well, they're never going to be safe. You just have to reduce the risk of. If what you're doing is a normal testing procedure and something explodey happens, like oh, that's not good. So yeah, you want you want to reduce the opportunities for it to explode. And previously, there had not been an explosion problem. That we uh, that everybody wakes up on Monday now with a gigantic explosion problem uh, uh, mm -hmm. as prime directive of what to deal with today. The other good news is because this was a ground-based test, they are going to have exquisitely fine data on what caused this thing, like as good as possible from, you know, high-speed capture to all of the instrument data. Like if you're going to have this catastrophic failure, be glad that it happened on the ground in this test and not in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, far well, away. that was the next test they were get, they were going to do. It's going to be the in-flight abort test. That was the next big milestone was to launch the rocket, then have uh, test the ability of the capsule to escape from the rocket. Yeah. Which, and all all I I don't I hope I'm wrong. I don't see how this doesn't get anything delayed. So yeah. Um, but in the meantime, uh, uh, keep in mind also, I mean. How great that the SpaceX story pie has so many different arms that like they're continuing to perfect their recovery of all of the pieces of, uh, you, you know, using the whole Buffalo. Uh, they, they continue to be able to put commercial missions up into space and science continues to go forward. It's mm -hmm. yeah, this is a setback setback for the manned space flight part of the story. And the worst case scenario is that we have to book more passage on a Soyuz rocket, which, by the way, still has a perfect track record of safety. Nobody has well, ever... Uh, except for the first one. <laughs> except for the first okay, okay. But in general, is it yeah, appears oh yeah. to be Soyuz very, very... Soyuz very reliable, very dependable. Yeah, the, the first guy he pancaked. But after that, then... <laughs> then it's great. Smooth sailing. <laughs> yeah, that was... You read the... You read the 
that accident. Oh, oh God. So uh, w what was the story on that? Can you can you give us the campfire uh, story? It's, it's basically like the parachute didn't deploy or whatever on or it came back down and then he re-entered it. The parachute didn't deploy and like all he found was like a shin bones or something. It was just horrible. It just, oh, my just, God. God. Yeah. That's so, crazy. Yeah. But yeah, uh, since then, like they've built it. You know, the Soyuz is crazy because it's like uh, it's very when they talk about the difference between like Russian engineering or Soviet engineering and. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, we don't have a thing. We'll figure out, like, okay, uh, we're going to have to land on land. Okay. Um, we're going to put our seats on basically big blocks of cushions or whatever. <laughs> you know, you know, we're going to have a 100-mile-an-hour impact. Okay, well, we'll just build a seat to stand 100-mile-an-hour impact. You know? Wow. You know, build it heavier. And, and it's, you know, it serves a purpose to a degree. You know, they've had, you know, they could build – you know, they didn't have the, you know, they weren't be able to work with titanium. Oh, funny story about, they weren't able to work with titanium like we could, even though they had a lot of titanium. So, like, was it the MiG-25 or whatever, which was their jet that could go up to, like, Mach 3? It was made out of steel. It's made out of steel. It was heavy as hell. But it could only go Mach 3 for, like, a couple minutes before the thing started to want to melt apart. Wow. It, it could go Mach 3, <laughs> you know? Do you know, you know, we had, in, in, we were and we were trying to figure out how to work with titanium for like the SR seven ones and all that. Well, a lot of that stuff they actually did the work here in Burbank. They couldn't get the titanium welds right. They couldn't figure out what was something was polluting it, whatever. And they finally figured out it was the it was the fluoride in the Burbank water supply. No kidding. Yeah, that's um, wild. So otherwise, it's good guys. Yeah, it's I was good. about to say. Right, it's good. Tur turns out there is a downside to fluoride in the water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. How it, how it slowed down the development of our spy planes. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine some guys sitting by the water cooler going, I have no idea. i got to figure this out. Those titanium welds just aren't working. I don't know what's going on either. <laughs> you know, it's like, your teeth look great, Frank. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, a Tally Zarella in our chat room says, this won't uh, trigger Alex Jones. I feel like fluoride in the water hampering spy planes being built by the government will make Alex Jones shake like a fembot in Austin Powers and have his head explode. <laughs> Uh, so gentlemen, um, I want to, I want to, I gotta, I, I'm going to do this one. I'll save this. I'll save this one for the next thing we talk about, but let's try the other thing. You know, what's the cool thing, which we didn't talk about on the show. Uh, what? Black hole photo. Oh yeah. Uh, what's the, what's the whole story? How do you take a picture of a black hole? Black hole is uh, it's a black hole. First to get a very big camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you take a picture of a black hole is a very good question. And, you know, you're talking about the amount of data they had to process to get this, because imagine like, a, you know, one of the ways that, you know, you do photography, like, a, you know, you, astronomy photography is you take your telescope, you aim it at a place in a place, and then you got to track to make sure that, you know, your telescope moves with the sky and you leave a plate there and you leave a plate there for hours and hours and hours and hours. And slowly enough photons from the thing you're trying to image hit your plate that eventually you get an image of something far off in distance. And the trick, of course, is keeping you have to know where that object is, because, you know, if you're trying to measure, you know, take a photograph of something that's, you know, a billion miles away. The problem is, of course, that. Uh, if it shifts slightly and you don't move or adjust your telescope as it shifts, then you're not going to capture the image. So a black hole is trying to capture a photo of that is like that problem, but scaled up like a million fold because this is something that's like, like this, I think this one's like another galaxy and you're not measuring the hole. You're measuring the discharge of all the energy around it. So you're trying to do this on a massive computational scale and figure out what is signal, what's not signal, looking for reinforcements of signal. It was an amazing achievement, you know, of, of what they did. And, you know, eventually they basically were able to, you know, build an algorithm that was able to follow and figure out what it's looking at. And, you know, part of what you can do too is you can say, no, the object moved. We're not going to use these frames. Yes, this is still object and frame. We'll do this and keep doing it until you get an image. I have no idea. I, as I understand it, I, you could imagine a bunch of black holes out there, um, and in general, uh, some of them have a lot of fuel entering the black hole, mm -hmm. uh, the stuff around it. Others of them don't have much. So if there's not much, then there's nothing really to see. It's just a black hole. But mm -hmm. you find a black hole that happens to have an accretion disk that is mm -hmm. sucking in all of this material, 
and also happens to be aligned. So it's roughly, uh, for lack of a better term, facing planet Earth. And yep. then you set up a, a now was this did I hear right? Like to create the virtual lens that collected this, they use like uh, 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 I, several satellites around planet Earth, or um, uh, or was it even in in the uh, in in the orbit of planet Earth? I believe that's the case. I believe that that's the way they had to make this thing work was just take all of this different composite data. Uh, extreme you know. extremetech.com says uh, it began in 2017 with seven radio telescopes around the world. Okay, around the world. Got around it. The world. So, so that's one way to get more fidelity is to have a longer exposure time, right? So you start collecting data, and then you uh, you also want the the size of the virtual lens to be big. So in this case, we're trying to create essentially a lens the size of the planet. Uh, this is one of those things where it's like in, in the next uh, once once space is open for business, I uh, it's it's not crazy to imagine a virtual telescope the size of the orbit of planet Earth. Just, you know, mm -hmm. 75, 80, 100, 300 satellites all in a big ring. And all of a sudden you could turn that lens and see with unprecedented uh, fidelity uh, super, super far. Yeah, and that is 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 you're explaining. You know, like one of the big changes in in uh, using uh, radio telescopes was, as you talked about, the very large arrays. Instead of like, yeah, like Arecibo, which is this big, huge friggin' dish, you know. But the other thing is you have uh, there's like the Paul Allen array, or whatever, which you've done SETI and a bunch of stuff through there. Yeah, you take you take a hundred of these radio telescopes, spread them across a large place, and then they're each kind of picking up part of the signal. And, you know, uh, as we saw in the Charlie Sheen movie Arrival, um, you know, <laughs> you're able to pick up, you know, all sorts of crazy things. So what a cool thing. You know, this was a, you know, the, the, you know, you've a lot of stories, you know, about, you know, the history of like when black holes were first suggested. And, ah, it's crazy. Talked into like, you know, once we had relativity and other ways to look at the frame of reference for like, yeah, this could be a real thing. And then, you know, there was still debate up until recently. Like, nah, black holes probably don't really exist. Some legitimate people had that opinion and now we're like no we're pretty sure these are a thing and not only that we've now got an image of a thing and it's something we never thought some we thought we never would have been able to image yeah so yeah because because this was organized by the, the 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 big algorithm of uh you know data and that's really just necessary because there's so much data coming in you have to figure out a way to make sense of it right yeah well and, yeah. and keep in mind also this is uh, what we're seeing is um a depiction of of basically the turbulence in the in the water. If you imagine, you know, a black hole as as a, as an eddy or uh, you know something uh, d disturbing the water around, we're we're seeing very clearly the disturbance around the black hole. Because, but the black hole itself remains, of course, a black hole. Yeah, we we still don't have a photo of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a very clear understanding of what this one, how it's affecting its environment and what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah a, we have we have a great educated guess of the framework that now we can look closer for that thing. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> Although think about it this way. Um, imagine you're watching uh, Venus transit the sun and you snap a photo of that. Technically, you're not seeing Venus because you're just seeing a black hole where Venus is blocking out the light of the sun. But you also pretty much got a picture of Venus, right? Yeah. Right. You know, you're. Pretty much like and that'll be the most visible that you can see the curves of it. Right. Like, you know, that it's that it's brilliantly kind of laid out there for you. Yeah. Them curves of Venus. Ooh, God. Venus curves. Hey, man, Andrew, to drop yeah. off so we can get weird. Yeah, yeah, you you, you want <laughs> to do this thing? guy? Yeah. Hey, Come on. I was about to say the only thing sexier than Venus's curves are those contributors over at patreon.com slash weird things. Ooh, Brian, you ain't just whistling Dixie. Patreon.com slash weird things <laughs> is where you can support this show and make sure you get your own custom RSS feed that gets you the after things show before anybody else. Shh, it's our little secret. <laughs> Head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah. We appreciate your support. Without it, it wouldn't be possible. And it keeps us from engaging in nefarious business activities or bending the rules in a way that perhaps we shouldn't. Got a story here. And 
I was trying to figure out like how to process this. Like, what what what's an analogy? Because I don't know. Um, personally, I'm pretty ignorant about how the rest of the world works, and there are things that I find amusing and funny. I'm like, ha ha, look at how they do that. Which there are people look at the way we do stuff and go, ha ha, look at how they do that, or look at their view of things. Um, and um, I want you to imagine. Um, I want you to imagine that you, you have a. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what I wish ill on anybody. Let's imagine like a Tony Robbins like figure. We'll call him uh, um, Stony Blobbins. Stony Blobbins. Stony Blobbins. This man is the Napoleon Bill of our era. Okay. <laughs> uh, this Stony Blobbins passes away. Right. And this is uh, a guy uh, that business. Uh, What's that? Oh, jeez. You know, uh, uh, a morning around the world as uh, self-motivation uh, titan Stony Blobbins uh, has been found dead. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, this just in. There's a recording Stony made before his demise, uh, wishing the whole world goodwill. I just want you to think about, visualize to the best of your ability, achieving your great goals. I'm not here to save you anymore, <laughs> but I believe so, uh, in you. Uh, Stony Blobbins passes away. Now Stony Blobbins' son is, and there's people are, hey, who are we going to go to? What are we going to go for our help? What are we, who are we going to talk to? This is hits all of us, leaves behind a big legacy. And his son says, you know, he's doing an interview about him. I'm like, yeah, you know, we're trying to fill his shoes. And, you know, I'll tell you a little about my dad, though. You know, he would help people out. And sometimes people might ask him for, I don't know, some dark advice, and he'd give that too. Maybe like he he like secretly taught like pickup technique or something, you know, or some kind of evil met Jedi mind tricks. Like, yeah, if you went to him, for that, he would teach you that too. You'd be like, what? He's a good guy, but he, he, but he would warn people like if you use this, you know. <laughs> This, this is sounding uh, uh, awfully close to like uh, uh, misinterpreting scam school lessons or something where it's like, yeah, look, no, no, flat out like, well, if you want to learn how to use this Jedi mind trick to do this, if you want to get revenge on somebody, I'll tell you how. If you want to ruin somebody's life, I'll tell you how, you know, like the, the, the dark. Oh, so he was, so what you're saying, uh, the, the now complicating legacy of Stony Blobbins is that uh, to know how to motivate somebody and to understand the human mind. Uh, he always perpetrated the best uh, uh, publicly. He wrote his books and his mm -hmm. seminars were all about that. However, <laughs> in you know his his inner circle, to understand the negative, he would explain the negative uh, uh, to a more selected, educated audience. And let's say this got out, and all of a sudden people are like, "What? I thought I thought it was only good." And maybe there was people like turning in the books, turning in all the stuff, the audio, like they still have the audio cassettes. Like, like you got to get rid of these because now it's it's tainted, it's tarnished, you know? Hashtag big cancel Stony Blobbins. Yeah. <laughs> and then the big bombshell happens. And then the revelation, which will lead right into what our story is, his son says, yeah, if you wanted a goblin, he would give you a goblin. Wait, like actually... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Shocking revelations in the legacy of Stony Blobbins today. As it turns out, he was deeply involved in the goblin trade. <laughs> Stony <laughs> Goblins is what he's being called. <laughs> Hashtag cancel goblins. Oh my God. So so not only would he tell you just a little bit of a, a, a you know, oh, you want to get revenge on somebody. Here's how you ruin their life. Uh, with the understanding that was for uh, entertainment purposes only. He went into the hard uh, world of, of goblin mongering. Goblin so monger? The, the parallel was, and I was trying to figure out, like, I know nothing about anything. So anybody. <laughs> no, I just love goblin monger. We have a title. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I read a story. I'm like, how do I put this into a context? I understand. So. This is from the Zimbabwe Blobbins News. Goblins. We need to make this shirt. We need a shirt that just says, Stony Blobbins sells goblins. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys need a goblin? Head on down to Stony Go Bob Bob Blobbins Goblins. We got so many goblins, it's green as far as the eye can see. So in uh, in uh, Zimbabwe earlier this month, a spiritual leader by the name of, uh, by whose name is not this, but this is how I pronounce it, Sekuru Ndunche, he passed away, and he was a very highly regarded, and some say feared, traditional healer. And then uh, his son was given their son, his children trying to fill the the you know the the void there. And then his son's in the middle of an interview is like, 
yeah, he's like, uh, um, you know, my yeah, if you wanted a goblin, my dad would give you a goblin too, you know, but he warned him and caused problems, but you know, it, it could be, you know, it could be kind of a bit of an issue. Before he, in the quote, before giving his clients some goblins, he would first warn those that wanted them that taking goblins would create a lot of problems. The, the, the clients were forewarned. I mean, this is a straight up trope from, you know, fantasy stories, right? Like, oh, you're talking about dark magic. You, you should only defend against it, not use it. What? Defense against the dark arts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or so, I guess defend against it. Yeah. You don't want to defend in, in our, in our For those Sorry listeners who are, may, have, may have caught up, we, we started covering goblin stories very at the beginning of Weird Things because we thought, oh, they're funny and adorable because they're all these African goblin stories. The most underreported story. Yes. We, there we there was of. a time that we were the world's number one, or the, the Western world's number one source for, for goblin news. Yes. yes. We, we may still be for all we know. <laughs> but um, And we laughed and we thought they're hilarious because we'd hear stories about goblins going into villages and ransacking people claiming, oh, a goblin came to me in the middle of the night and this and that. And goblins going into girls' schools and copying problems. <laughs> like, oh, those goblins. And then and then we're like, you know, maybe it's a maybe that word doesn't mean what we think that means. <laughs> and it didn't. Uh, <laughs> as it turned out, that was. Goblin tended to be a catch-all for some really dark behavior. Which Mainly when somebody else says, I'm possessed. You know, when somebody's possessed, yeah. there may be a goblin. You don't see it. It's not like, ah, I'm a goblin. It's like, oh, I did it. I did these bad things, but it wasn't me. There was a goblin made me do it. Like, oh, okay. So yeah. do we think that this was Stony Blobbins saying, like, oh, this is, like, your indulgence? Like, you're allowed to do something awful because I'm, like, giving you yeah. the... I, I, I think in this context it means, oh, I will give you a spirit that you can... A goblin spirit you can use to go get revenge or whatever. Right, so so picture, uh, in my mind, I'm imagining he hands you an old mayonnaise jar and he says, okay, what you do, uh, there's a goblin in there, you go to the place where you want to release the goblin, you open it, you inhale it, and whatever happens next, that's the goblin's doing, not yours. And then... Oh, no, I, I, I think it may mean, it could mean, maybe, but it could mean like Red Witch style, like open the goblin and, and it's going to fly out and go do harm to your enemies. Got it. Oh, so so it's like a hex, like a like like yeah. a Creole yeah. hex. I could be but, too. Could be like first, it came back, it missed the jar, it went into me, and I ate all my kids' Easter candy. To 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 get to this jar, you have to walk past the stony blobbins bed of coals. <laughs> It's me, Stony Blobbins. Listen, if you believe in yourself, what you believe, what the mind can believe and conceive, it can achieve. Stony Blobbins sells goblins. I just, yep. I've never wanted a, a, a weird thing shirt more than just plain text on a shirt that just says in block letters, Stony Blobbins sells goblins. Oh, well, if you want them. We got them. Maybe that could be a weird things thing we sell. We should have our store would be like a mayonnaise jar that we say there's a goblet inside. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it good. seems we're ne we'll, we'll, we'll never be able to travel to Africa again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't. I'm not allowed for import in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Domestic use only. We're, we're oh, going gonna to uncheck water, that. Charity goblin. We're going to uncheck that box on Shopify. Sorry, we don't deliver there. Yep, yep, or you know, lockpicks to Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Hmm. Goblin catchers. Hmm. Interesting. Thinking here. I uh, want to go to picks. Yeah, I got. I got a fun one. Uh, I only just started it, but uh, man, you know what's great is is that transformation when there are new realms that you can treat your eleven year old like your peer. And I had that this weekend because hey, I. I got I got news for you. Yeah, yeah, In your we, case, eleven year olds are your peers. I know, I know. <laughs> but I felt it uh, because we hopped on VR this weekend and we played a game called I Expect You to Die. And it's great. <laughs> it's father daughter bonding game. It's oh, so no, much it's fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah, so so I expect you to die in in the vein of like a James Bond type thing. Starts with this amazing credit sequence. And then um, uh, uh, that's happening all around you in the style of James Bond. And then uh, you go on your first mission, which is to drive a car 
out of a plane so that they can tinker around with it. And these are like ex escape room style puzzles. Exactly. You're stuck right? in one place and you're trying to get something done. Or I've seen the um, the window washer one. Uh, I've not seen that one. That, that might is... be a later one. Yeah, I we've only know. we've only gotten at the very beginning here uh, in the in the car. And so you're constantly dying. And so it's a bit of a Groundhog Day type thing where it's like the moment the game starts, you look around, you're like, okay, what? Let me poke and prod everything before I do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, there's a fire extinguisher. I bet I bet at some point there's gonna be fire. Let me set that around. But the first thing, like when you turn the key in the car, it scans your retina and decides you're not Dr. Villain or whatever. And it shoots a, a laser. So you have to dodge to the side. And then you have to, it says secondary thing activated and bomb comes out. You have to defuse the bomb. So that means, you know, you had to have checked uh, uh, the... Um, uh, the instructions on bomb How defusal. To the bomb, yeah. It's great. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's uh, from what I understand, it's a short-ish experiment yeah. experience, like maybe five or six hours. But but for now, having everything be novel, it's well worth the the, the twenty something bucks. That's cool. Do you know what movie? Which movie that was from? That line? Uh, oh, that, that was Doctor No. James right? Bond. Uh, I think it was Goldfinger. Oh, I, 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 do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect, I'm you, expect to die. you to die. He's yeah. on the laser table. You know, that yeah. was, you know, Goldfinger was such a. <laughs> oh, it was Goldfinger. You are correct. Yeah, it was Goldfinger. Yeah. Yeah. I just loved that line. It gets a great movie. It's like, so you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs> they, they, got, they got a great uh, a theme song that's real catchy. It gets stuck in your brain. It's got like a. Uh... Uh, a narrator, a little British man narrator. Yeah. Oh, you you really bungled that one. And he he like talks to you as you're like doing things and making choices in the game. Yeah. Stuff, right. Yeah. Yeah. It looks fun. That's cool. I love. I I don't partake, but I love where it's going. I'm excited about the potential for this. And then with the new generation of VR stuff coming out, and I I'm I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I want to like Vader Immortal. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I don't know anything about that. What's the story there? Oh, oh, oh Vader Ooh. Immortal. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Vader Immortal is like a multi-part virtual reality experience based on Darth Vader. Okay. Uh, oh, so this uh, this will be on Vive and Oculus. Uh, I think it's going to be one of them exclusively. Um, is this a game or a, a just a, a VR uh, show? I I think a bit of both. Okay, okay, that's cool. Yeah, but you know they they put it's a Lucasfilm like they put a lot of effort into this thing. So, you know they're, they're trying to do kind of a new cutting edge sort of experience at that. So, oh, cool. you know this said, got, this said Oculus Studios on it, so I'm gonna bet yeah. it's an Oculus thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I was about to say, uh, uh, only one of those two companies has a habit of writing very large checks to keep things ex exclusive. Mm -hmm. Well, and they've, they've narrowed it down to, like, I think partners they've worked with, but this was with, you know, with the Lucasfilm uh, labs, and I think the goal was to try to create, like, kind of like a really, really, you know, let's put a lot of effort into, like, a really big experience. So, but anyhow, yeah. uh, what else we got? Uh, hey, there's a show called Game of Thrones. Uh, man, oh. it's been on for a minute, and uh, they got new episodes airing now. I can't tell you how much I enjoy it back in my life, and I'm glad that the writing's better than last season because I really liked the last two, the first two episodes of the season. Oh, really? Uh, mm. I, I am, uh, I am. Look, Game of Thrones has a lot of credit. It's the best show that's ever existed. Um, and if I think of this last season as a ten-hour movie, I don't mind so much the idea that literally nothing happens in the first two hours of a 10 hour film. But if That's I think about, hours, you have to sit there. If, if, if I, <laughs> if I think about the week after week television watching experience, a little frustrated, a little bit frustrated. I, was, I, I don't know. I, uh, to me, the, the first episode, I think suffered from the fact that there were a lot of very samey scenes that they had to jam into one episode of like, oh, here's another set of two characters that last saw each other during tremendous emotional or physical climax that now have to patch together some kind of working relationship because they are up against it. But to me, this last episode, a lot of things happened in that it, it begins with this a shattering of the understanding that, you know, we're all on the same page. Uh, and then... It's about exactly how not on the same page everybody is and, and how much on the same page some people are. So I thought it was it was it was everything I like in Game of Thrones in that it was about the characters reacting to stuff. And like, yes, it is 
they sold this episode as the big battle episode. They in, did. In, that, the that, that frustrated me. The preview last week was like, all right, it's starting. We're getting on with it. And then yeah. as as I was watching just the pro- – I was like 20 minutes in. Uh, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. Oh, they're yeah, not going to do and that, it. So that it- – I loved because I was enjoying everything that was happening. I'm like, oh, this is just going to be all preamble and we're going to end right at the beginning. And that's exactly what happened. And I loved how we got there. But it was I, I think if, if there's if there's a, a, a legitimate crit, it is like because even in the the previews after the first week. They showed scenes from the week after this to sell the idea that there is going to be a big old battle, that it was going to be like our, our Helm's Deep in Two Towers yeah. uh, episode. And like like that, like Game of Thrones has done so exceptionally throughout uh, its its history. So uh, next week, I guess we're getting that. But this week I loved like all, all the I mean, pretty much scene by scene. They were just uh, uh all these like, all right, now that we've had this awkward reintroduction to everybody, we can kind of step forward. So uh, I, I'm I'm I would like you guys. I'm like, oh, this is going to be our two towers episode. Yeah. And then like, you know, I remember the thing. Two towers being a pretty long battle. And this this this. And then but then I'm like, I think that expectation worked against. But man, this is the last time we get to spend time with these characters. You know, and mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of what we're getting. And and there were some really funny, you know, giant Bane and some other stories and stuff last night that, that are like such a weird we're story. Worth... Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's like that's kind of been a hallmark of that show is uh, the conversations that happen under siege, mm-hmm. basically, and and some of the most iconic character moments that we've ever gotten. Like like think of. Uh, <laughs> You know, Cersei getting just super wine drunk during that uh, uh, the the Battle of the Blackwater in you know season two. The, these are the moments when we get these kind of like character defining secrets come out. Uh, we see the true colors, uh, kind of uh, you know forged in fire moments, and we really we we got a whole episode of it. It was not <laughs> this gigantic. Uh, a spectacle which I I could I could definitely understand frustration because I was like halfway through I'm like man they're gonna really jam this uh, entire battle into like you know like the last <laughs> ten minutes of the show and yeah. apparently yeah. next week's is like an hour and a half long that so someone on Twitter was was going saying that it's the the biggest battle ever filmed and the most people and it'll. It, I guess it's bigger than whatever record Lord of the Rings set back in the day. Um, so I'm. Yeah, I've been. Uh, uh, they've been. You know, reporting about this. You know, battle has has kind of been the like defining. Like this is like the centerpiece of the you know idea of Game of Thrones. This is the Game of Thrones set piece to end all Game of Thrones uh, uh, set pieces. So we will see. But uh, I'll tell you what, giving giving it a full episode to set it up. It does. I'm very clear what the plan is, who's going to be where. Like, uh, uh, if if all of a sudden they're like, oh, they're attacking the left flank. I'll know where all the characters I care about are. I'll know if their plan is successful or not. So I'm in. I'm locked in. I love the episode. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited for this battle. <laughs> Uh, I have a pick. I, I sat down and watched this over the weekend and, and had a had a pretty good time with it. Uh, Netflix, I guess, uh, got the rights to, to Beyonce's big Coachella performance from last year. She did that big homecoming or uh, uh, Baychella performance, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, Netflix now has like a two plus hour uh, concert film of that performance. It's uh, the it's both shows or it's it's footage from both shows and you can clearly tell when they're cutting between them because they have completely different outfits uh, for each each of the two shows um, but also these these good if if not really small interstitial bits um, every so often of like you know here's them working on it here's Beyonce talking a little bit about like you know, we spent four months working on the music and then four months on the dancing and stuff um, to the point where I wanted more of that because that stuff was really fascinating. And this thing is such a huge spectacle. There are hun- like 100 plus people on stage, all this live music, uh, even 
from like a recording standpoint of uh you know they talk about like well there's a lot of there's a lot of drumline stuff there's a lot of horns there's stomps there's uh shouts from the dancers and you have to figure out how to mic all of that stuff because you can't give everybody a microphone and so how do you deal with that while also making it a festival show where you have to be able to amplify that out to you know thousands of people watching i wanted i wanted a lot of that stuff because that that i i love that sort of stage tech uh technical stuff uh but i, I thought this was pretty good uh, a little long it's it's over two hours uh but it's it's like non-stop it's it's just song after song after song uh, and I think they even put out a live album version of it on uh, on streaming services. So you can actually listen to these live versions uh, without having to watch the film. Uh, and so that's that's pretty cool. It's uh, homecoming. The, 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 the knock on Beyonce's uh, movie or docu- self-documentary habit <laughs> has been that I mean, she obviously controls everything. This is not produced by an outside documentarian like she is doing all of this herself this is part of the machine that that she has created and in the past her documentaries can obviously feel like things that were made by the subject and and be a little uh, soft pedally Mm -hmm. uh obviously i think she kind of hit the exact right note with like the the short film for or the the film the video this thing for uh uh lemonade uh, but but did you feel that this was kind of too light and too bay propaganda y? Um, I uh, I I think it was so light on the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, there's there's a lot of her like being you know kind of giving everyone the real talk, like hey, you know, we're just not there yet. We really need to all knuckle down and make this stuff work. And you know, I can keep giving you notes, but until you implement my previous notes, then there's no reason for me to you know all these like you know uh signs that like she is definitely in charge of this process and and yeah. being sort of the executor of, of every single piece and she gives it, it it's uh it gives good context for sort of the meaning behind the show and the challenges around it right you know she had just had a set of twins the year before uh and an emergency c-section and she was trying to lose all the all the baby weight and stuff so it, it's i think in that respect of like setting up the obstacles and and the other context around it i guess you can see it a little bit of that um but i also think it is it's it's a really like stunning sort of performance you know i was watching some of the coachella stuff from this weekend and and like this outshadowed everything all of the big names were like nothing compared to you know what what this performance was so um a a little bit of column a a little column b i'd say um, my pick, man, like, um, I'm late, Andrew late to everything. You know, that's my, my whole theme in life. It's like, everybody else says this thing, I'm like, oh, that's a cool thing. And then like, eventually like, oh, the wire, that's actually a pretty good show. Everybody, ah. you know, um, I mean, I, I, I arrested development, you know, I, I got onto that show 10 years after it first went off the air. I'm like, this show's hilarious. <laughs> um, my new thing is like. Um, I buy stupid stuff all the time. I buy stupid stuff all the time. I think it's like my, I'm not a too big of a gadget geek, but I do buy stuff. You know, I have like a f- virtual reality camera, stuff like this. I've got like every wireless VR headset thing. You know, I've got stacked up sitting over here. I've got weird AR stuff, things like that. Play it for an hour or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Put it in a box. Forget about it. Mm-hmm. Um, a buy thing that, uh, uh, it, it, a lot of people already have. I'm like, yeah, we have this, and I'm like, yeah, it's really cool. I'm like, yeah, we know. It's why it's a big industry now, and it kind of happened while, while everybody else, I don't know. Anyhow, um, Bibles. I'm lazy. What's that? Bibles. Yeah, Bibles. Yeah, <laughs> Christianity, guys. You know, <laughs> um, uh, I'm I'm lazy. I'm a very lazy man. I mean, I'm very focused. If I'm working on a thing I want to work on, it's great. But if it's something I don't want to work, on, I, I've got. I'm embarrassed. I've got packages over here of like, hey, we want you to review this book. Like, great. I haven't opened it. Like, oh, here's some cables and stuff I really needed. Forgot to, the Amazon package has been there for a month. Haven't opened it. It's mm-hmm. just, not, it's not in my world. Um, things like, uh, like if I eat food, everything goes, I like wash my dishes. I'm very, very thick meticulous about not leaving food out. Dusting, vacuuming, 
not so much. You know, kind of like, ah, I'll get to it. Is company coming over? Then I'll clean scrupulously. I'm finally like, you know what? Like, I got some dust here and stuff. And, you know, apparently they have robots that take care of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So I'm like looking online. I'm like, let me go find one. And they're all pretty much the same. But I end up buying one of these. It's not, I didn't buy the, the Roomba. I bought the, uh, this was the, what model is this? An Amory brand which is pretty similar tech to this which is a robot vacuum plug this thing into its little station said clean watch this thing go out and work its way around the apartment and clean up all the stuff it was amazed <laughs> did, did. I, so, so so it worked worked great it worked great i'm looking <laughs> at my floors like it looks great and i'm like i'm sitting at my desk here and it's like it's like it starts pushing against my chair. It's like, mm, mm, I'm going to clean here now. I'm like, oh, okay. I scoot over, scoots in here. It goes in there. It's like a little cleaning person. You know, it goes in there, cleans it. Like, oh, under your desk under there, it looks horrible. I'm like, lift up my feet. It goes, meow, meow, meow. And then it drifts, wanders off. And I'm like, and I hear the sound. Like, where is it? Like, oh, it's cleaning under the couch. <laughs> you know? Oh, wow. Then it moves out. And I, I don't hear it for a while. And I walk into my bedroom. And I look at my carpet. My carpet's clean. And then I hear it underneath the TV thing. I look out of there. And it's like, it pokes its little head out. Like, oh, I'm cleaning under here, too. A lot of dust here. You might want to empty out this dust bit. I'm like, okay. Um, hmm. It was amazing <laughs> that's cool what's uh which one did you say you got it Amory? i got the uh the, it's spelled a m a r e y um it's the robot vacuum 400 pa 200 but there's like you click the coupon to get 25 dollars off so it was like a, i got like a 30 dollar coupon so it was like 170 dollars hmm. um when i bought it and there are other ones out there there's there's it's a competitive market now it's not just roomba it's a competitive market you know, the way the thing works is pretty clever. Have you ever looked at how these work up close? No. No, no they so, they do, like, mapping, right? As they go around, they try to figure out the boundaries of, of your yeah, floor they, plan? Yeah, they, they they'll do, like, the mapper. Sometimes do a random walk. But what they have, to is, like, you, map, you have the disc, and they have these, these, like, whiskers, these bristles that spin around on the outside and sweep everything into the vacuum, right? So it's, it's actually, like, scraping stuff up. It's not just a vacuum cleaner. It sucks. It's actually, like, whisking things, too. And you can say corners, and it'll go up against your corners, and it'll do a more detailed job of trying to get all the things in the corners. Yeah, you see the, the spinning side brushes, right? So, uh, and then it has, like, the charging dock. So I click, I tell this thing to start running. It goes around, makes its way around there, and then when it's into, into, into charge, it just goes back to the charging dock and just plugs itself back in. And again, yeah. people so people have had Roombas for years. Like, yeah, Andrew, it's called a Roomba. You know, it's like it's the way it works. But um, amazing. You just, I just, as a remote, press a button, cleans, cleans up the floor. You know, the joke of my girlfriend. I go like, all right, your turn to do the chores. You know, press the button. Beep. Yeah. So wow. big fan. Does carpet all of this? Big believer. Big, big, big believer. Cool. Yeah. Will it do? I I have a uh, like a long hair like rug does it work with that sort of stuff because that's the, it that's can the... work with it can go with like yeah i don't know the the thickness but it had i had you know went, went into my carpet went went over that did that hmm. so uh i i was so i'm so sold now on the robot revolution i just ordered a mop uh irobot makes a robot mop thing which is a little square type thing pull it up you put a pad in it you put water in this thing you set it back down and it goes around your floor and scrubs your floor now it doesn't go back to a charging station it's only got like like a 20 minute sort of charge or whatever on it oh my god but uh that's a whole new thing is is you know it see we're looking at the photo here it's got this it's got like one of those, thing. the swiffer jets yeah Yes. Oh. oh wow! Hold on, now you're talking my language. <laughs> Hold on, cause that oh, I look at that thing. That thing looks like it can clean bird poop. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking about my three daughters <laughs> and the fact that there's all hardwood down uh, and and tile downstairs. Yeah. That's what I have here. Is like I have mainly tile. I have a wood, fire, you know, you know, full full wood floor, which the vacuum, the 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 vacuum was great for. So now, now cleaning day is gonna be, let the vacuum sweep. All right, send out the mop. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, very cool. They also have combo units. I don't know if they're better or worse, but I was very happy with this unit. I was very happy with this one. It worked out really well. No, I, I or- part, part of the reason I, I wear uh, flip-flops all the time is because uh, I think I would go barefoot a lot more if if there's like maybe one day a month after after everything's mopped that I feel like I can handle being barefoot. 
And then mm -hmm. uh, immediately everything just is too dusty and gross. Uh, well, so. again, this thing, this vacuum was great for the dust because I have the hardwood floors too. Yeah. And it worked wonderfully, wonderfully. Right I have, on. I have not been, and I'm sure most of them are all kind of like this. <laughs> I was just, I was elated at how good of a job it did. Because I went to go clean out the dust bin and it's ton. And I'm like, I'll, I'm after we're done with the show, I'm going to go let it run again just to get another deeper cleaning. I'm going to set it to do corners and stuff. Cool. And it has an air filter. The the vacuum, the Emory has an air filter, does a hundred minutes of charge, charges itself. You can set a you can set a time thing so when you leave the house, it can say, All right, I'm gonna go clean now and go automatically clean. The robot mop is different. The robot mop is basically you don't use it less frequently, but basically it's got like a handle. You pick it up, you put a pad, a cleaning pad on there, you put water in it, you set it down, you say run, and it just goes around and mops and whatever for a period of time. And if you had, but if you had a pet stain or something around, you could just put the mop on and turn it on, and it's gonna. God, I can't believe you just cool. talked me into buying a robot vacuum. <laughs> that's that's Dude, insane. I'll, I didn't think that was possible. I'll, I, you know, the problem is here's here's the sales problem on robot vacuums because like I go to my parents' house. My parents have had one for years, right? My mom has always had a meticulous house, always had a super clean house. She cleans. She has maids that come in clean, and she says, oh, and we got the robot vacuum. I'm like, I, I guess it works. Your house is always clean. How do I know that it's doing anything? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an easy gig to be the robot vacuum in your house, to be honest with you. <laughs> when I turned on the robot vacuum in my place, <laughs> that was the trial by fire. Yeah. Very cool. So. Uh, and I'm excited about what else is going to come out now. Like, what other technologies are out there? Because I'm like, huh, like, I, if you want to do, like, cool Kickstarters, like, hey, you know, can we build a thing that, like, you know, cleans a bathroom that, you know, sits on a wall or whatever that does something kind of cool or, you know, something that's fixes in places, but it's got, like, a, you know, something. I'm like, there's, I think it's going to be a big, big, big market now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is already, you know, but, so. I bet, I bet they could figure out something for, like, Windows, yeah. Like you set it on a window pane and it figures out where the boundary is and then it does it it does it by itself. I don't know. That would be Man, people in the thing. chat are talking about robot lawnmowers and I'm losing my mind. Oh yeah, those are a big thing now. Yeah. And JC Cummings, yeah, there have been some things that like C E S and their their dryers that will fold your clothes. But it's like what? That, oh my god. That stuff gets specific. But... Made a comment. Have you heard about these machines that wash your clothes? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh he said wash. Shut no, but up. but there are Shut uh, I think there is one that will fold some things, or maybe it'll hang stuff up. Uh, but it's yeah, it's particular. Yeah, I've seen the folding one. It still looks like kind of a. I'm just like I'm just gonna get stuff that doesn't wrinkle. But yeah. I think that I think that specialized robotics is you know I robot proof with the Roomba. They said we can solve this one thing really really well. I mean we had back in the day you had pool cleaners like we had, we had the pool cleaner which was just used mm. random vibrations to make its way around your pool, but. You know, yeah. The, the you look at this clothes folding machine. It's oh, you like have to feed it like a, a kitchen, like a subway like a oven. Savage. Ugh, yeah. I don't know about that. Hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a. There's got to be better. Well, one of the things that's happening too is with robotics and stuff is that we're building better tools and smarter, you know, general hands. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. Very I'm cool. I'm now looking at uh, robot uh, lawnmowers. <laughs> <laughs> it's and it's strangely satisfying you know yeah so cool gentlemen it's been weird man these get expensive yeah uh <laughs> just just because you mentioned your mom uh andrew i for, there's something just made me i could not stop laughing because i remembered something uh, that you had told me not at... a good way to start a conversation with somebody who's not your friend it's something about your mom no uh, it was something that you mom... stop laughing go on justin go on during during the run-up to don't trust i remember you told me that you had a conversation with your mom in which your mom recommended a title for what the tv show should be called <laughs> do you remember what it was no it was Antics with Andy. <laughs> you know, a better title than Don't Trust Andrew Maine. And it's, I, uh, hard for me to give my mom credit, but 
Oh, I that's great. I'm uh, laughing. Antics with Andy. Oh, well, speaking of which, I'm, I'm, I'm watching late at night the new Chucky trailer, right? And mm-hmm. so I watch TV late at night, and all of a sudden my girlfriend hears me go, <laughs> because at the very end of the Chucky trailer, Chucky goes, Good night, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is strangely personalized here. But, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I used a scene from, uh, almost uh, pr- not quite verbatim, a pretty close scene in my, one of my, uh, in my station breaker book or orbital in my orbital book where my character, Dave Dixon is Hank goes to an outback steakhouse with his parents. And the fact that he saved the world and all this other stuff, not a big deal. Like, like he makes some comment and like, you know, and it's just this sort of like, yes, hand. So, all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just maybe if you hadn't screwed things up so badly, whatever, you know, and it was just because I remember it's like I've told people like, oh, your parents probably like a TV show like they're indifferent to me getting TV show didn't care books and bookstores that they liked. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. That was the, the TV. Who cares? TV books. Wow. <laughs> you know. No, that's definitely the case with like uh, YouTube videos versus, you know, like it was a different game when 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 the TV box was mentioned. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, cool. Well, do we have a second? Sure. Yep. All right. Cool. Yep. I'll run to the restroom. All righty. Hey, Justin. Just me and you, Bryce. Just you and me. How you doing, man? Uh, pretty good, man. Pretty good. Yeah. You know, I switched my streaming schedule back to the mornings. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I saw that. Uh, so now this is the last thing that I have to do today, which is uh, good. Ooh, so I've nice. been doing the uh, what's it called? The newsletter. Yeah, I saw you're doing. Uh, uh, was it you're doing Marvel Week on Jury Daily? I am. What's I'm Marvel Week? Because leading up to Endgame, just uh, talking about how I got into comics and and specifically, I don't know if I've talked about this anywhere, but I figured this would be the week to do it. Uh, I never really collected comics like ever in my life. Like uh, I've pretty much read comics in book like bound book form my entire life. And the the encyclopedic knowledge I have of the Marvel Universe, a hundred percent came from collecting comic cards. So oh. I I would just collect binders full of these comic cards. Yeah. Uh, and and really that was the big uh, you know even you know when when the death of Superman thing happened, I read the novelization. Like I didn't even read the. I, I think the I wound book. up reading the comic books eventually, but yeah. For whatever reason, I wanted to read the novelization more than I wanted to read the comics. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, so we're talking about uh, all that uh, on on jury today and just weird ways that people got into that kind of stuff. And then also with the larger, the larger overarching thing being like, these were all like weird activities. And now mm-hmm. it's the only cultural touchstone that the world can seem to agree upon is sure. like, Star Wars and comic books. Yeah, it's it's like normalized. I uh, I never got into comics either. For me, like comic book issues were always too sh- too short. You know, graphic novels, my friend. Well, yes, okay, but uh, I'm specifically talking about comics, I, or and I didn't know enough about like how that stuff worked to know about trade uh, trades or paperbacks or uh, any sort of collection stuff. Yeah, so. I, I really I just didn't have anybody that I was friends with or even any of my friends that were like into it that were like, oh, we're going to the comic book store. Like what, what, like the only time that I would go to a comic book store were, was to buy comic cards. And even then it's like, I for, like I never got into that. I, I never got into the thing that theoretically these were there to advertise for. Like this was mm-hmm. ancillary material that would hopefully benefit the bottom line of more kids my age going to buy comic books. And yet I just, I never crossed over. I'm just like, this is super cool. I get to learn about all these cool new characters and card form and memorize their stats. I almost never, like, I, I was always more waiting for, I mean, I have tons of comics somewhere. Like, I'd be in a run or something, but I was more into the graphic novels were my favorite thing. That being said, when I was younger, like, I'd, I'd go buy, like, Iron Man, get every Iron Man for a while or something. Uh, have you seen this, by the way? This is Soylent, Soylent Square? No. Yeah, they're little energy bars now. They came out with now they're like 100 calories each, and then they have their bridge. Instead of a full 400 calorie soylent, it's a 180 calorie soylent. So, huh. If you're inclined. 
I've never tried to, uh, I've never tried any of the Soylent stuff before. I have active contempt for everything I've heard about the story of Soylent. Oh. It's all about the name, though, for you, right? No, no. It's about, um, it's, it's the, The uh, name is a very, it's, is a, is weird that they're committing to the name. It's but. well, but and the the story it's the 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 story is identical to Airborne. Uh, Airborne, uh, uh, someone got vitamins uh, at a huge discount, and then they're like created by a teacher. You're like, oh, so not a scientist. Got it. And uh. this dude's got like an engineering background, and he's convinced he's cracked all of nutrition. And I'm like, all right. I mean, whatever. I don't. Like, I don't think that they were like. I think. I don't. I think it's a very different than Airborne. Uh, Airborne doesn't work. Uh, Soylent was like, hey, like what? What's the minimal thing I need for a drink? Because in the world of like muscle powders and all these other stuff, there was so a lot of stuff that was just garbage. That was, and he's like, what's the minimal thing you need, you know, nutrient wise? And they try to figure out like, let's let's put out a product that's that. I don't. It wasn't presented as like, we cured the cold, guys. It was just like, ah, and like I drink it. It's fine. I like it because everything else I try to drink that's like minimum nutrient. It's got a lot of stuff else in it that I don't want, or it's muscle milk, or it's some chocolate shake crap, whatever kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think I that's can exactly agree. The what guy's the founder. Is. He is a very <laughs> he's uh, the, the douche factor may be pretty high there. Maybe you well, know, and but... plus also like you know, if, uh, if a mentalist is going to do a Q and A act, what you do is you set yourself up so that both sides, uh, no matter whether you're right or wrong, you get to claim victory. And that's what the guy did. He was like, oh no, and I solved it. And then, you know, I noticed that I was having a craving for meat, so then I added some meat stuff in there. It's like, okay, we get it. You get to say, you, you get to constantly say you've solved it, and then whenever anything's wrong, you're all like, that's what's great about us, is that we've added or subtracted. And it's like, so you're con gonna be constantly coming out with revisions and constantly saying that you solved it. Got it. Well, I mean, sure. I does it work for me? Does it work for a lot of other people? I know. Yes. Is is there? Is is as far as if you're looking for? I I used to drink Boost. I used to drink these other things, and this thing was a bit. I found it to be a better product. You know. Yeah, I, I think it it really, at least in my social circle, caught on with uh, engineers and coders who, by and large, live. You know, even the active ones live fairly sedentary lives that have complicated relationships with food. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, my uh, the, the most glowing endorsement I ever got was uh, a friend of mine saying, uh, "This brings us one step closer to the future I want to live in, where all food is flavorless, nutritional paste mm -hmm. that I get to imbibe every you know x amount of hours mm -hmm. that uh, lasts me, uh, so I don't have to worry about allergies or something in my food that's not." good for me or that I don't like and he's a picky eater and everything sure. so it's like I think for a certain crowd it was great but to me the, the comp is not uh, uh, airborne but rather you know they found a way to market you know slim fast for nerds yeah sure I, I think that's okay and I would say that there is a bit of a difference but ultimately that was what it replaced like for me was was those shakes or stuff like that because I said like I want something that's just a, a, a more precise version of that. And your point, Brian, like, yeah, he didn't, he just invented, you know, there was the history of people like, I've got the new drink is it's, it's, you know, it's, they're all kind of snake and snake oil salesmen to, to a degree. Mm -hmm. This company is no different, but I'm like, oh, they're innovating and coming to cool stuff. And there's imitators now like Huel and other people trying to sort of get on that because there's a need. Like I've always wanted that. Like, I just want the thing. If I'm busy, just give me this thing to drink. You know, yeah. and then I can move on. Yeah, and and of course, I I'm, I'm assuming that you understand. Like, I don't want to take anything away from anybody who's enjoying it. Everybody should enjoy. No, Brian, I'm throwing it out now. <laughs> <laughs> My robot vacuum's sucking it up right now. I definitely, I definitely just clicked the one click buy for a robot vacuum. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say silent. I was like, wow, that's a quick turn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I also think the other the other side that the Soylent crowd kind of fell into is, uh, you know, just calorie counters. Like if you are on a specific calorie count thing, this is designed for you to. All right, now the, no must, no fuss. Just eat and drink these things and nothing else. Right, and everything else that you want. Oh, dude! Like that's like I've lost twelve pounds in the last six or seven weeks. Wow. Doing, by doing lean cuisines and this, you know, just like mm. knowing exactly what I'm eating, you know, and that's a thing too is like no snacking or know exactly what I'm eating. Man, yeah. it makes a difference, you know. 
I just like eating so, too much. Yeah, you know. Let's do after things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, I got do... that story, Bryce. Give me one. I just wanted to. I read. Sure. Uh, scan the most of it. You, Bryce sent a a good story here, and everything's out of control on my computer. Okay, everything's back to normal. Everybody relax. Okay. Everybody relax. Nobody panic. Okay, let me just. I was. It was about Luminary. Right. Um. So. Justin, what's your uh, what's your go to news circuit? Like if I'm just looking for news, well, yeah, like uh, like uh, it, you know, I, I uh, Google News is has been my sort of default starting place, and then you know maybe I'll add Reddit and and I roll, and then uh, Axios is going on there now as far as as part of a regular rotation. Uh, what what else should I add? Uh, I mean, look, you like uh, the drudge. Uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to say that it is anything other than what it is. But uh, I drudge report has been the place that I've gone first every day since I started searching the Internet uh, wow. in, in the early 90s. Like it is always been fascinating to me because he it's it's so interesting to watch him drive the media. He will make stories because it is still the website that people in the media go to first because they don't like when your entire like national brand international brand is i got i broke the biggest story of my era on the internet nobody wants to get beaten by him or they want to sniff out if he's trying to hint at something and then follow those leads i noticed that uh on the google news that they've got prominently displayed off to the right, a fact check station section, which I think is interesting because um, that's how I find out a lot of things that people think <laughs> like, uh, I was like, like, no, this video does not show Lady Gaga reciting the Quran. And I was like, today I learned <laughs> somebody thinks that <laughs> Lady Gaga was reciting the Quran. Interesting. Yeah. Cause it's, it's basically just another one of these Google News verticals, but for all of the websites for current bullshit. That, <laughs> that, well, no, but for all of the sites that exist just to, uh, you know, to do fact checking, do fact checking, or or you know, uh, that's interesting. That's weird, man. I, I, I don't know. There's a whole larger <clears throat> conversation that we can have about how <clears throat> how platforms should feel about themselves and and at what line. It is the platform's responsibility versus the user's responsibility to live an educated life. Hmm. I'm ready to go. Uh, obviously, my connection today is garbage. So well, Your um, audio is still coming in fine. So I'm, I'm... Okay. You know what's so weird is that I can see Andrew's connection to me is perfect. It really? is just for whatever reason what is going to you. But whenever it switches over to Andrew... Like I can in my little like I have that little tiny window where Andrew is running fine. Weird. Yeah, part of like I, I listened to an interview with like the the creator of Skype, and and one of the things that's inter weird about Skype is like it's like peer to peer, you know, and so it's 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 ah, I'm gonna send video to you, I'm gonna send video to you, and I'm gonna send video to you, and there's a lot of you know, a lot of stuff. It's reasons just like the Hangouts and other things kind of work. Better or simplified, but anyhow, we'll proceed. Yeah. Uh, Bryce just killed me. I just no, voted off the show. I, I tried to refresh a thing, but we haven't gotten a new video frame from you. And uh, let me uh, let me send you a new one. Here. All right. Let's see. Ah. Hey. Okay. That, <laughs> that works. That works I like I, I like J Jolly Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a bear in my apartment. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, well, uh, if you're good to go, then uh, okay. I'll count you in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. Castillo, Castillo. Castillo. <laughs> uh, Bryce brought up a story, which is really nice when Bryce decides to contribute with a story. Oh my god! What? <laughs> oh, uh, it's a good story. I just, <laughs> I don't know why I went all condescending on. That. <laughs> oh, you think being an equal partner means you're an equal partner, Bryce? <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, no, you always have good stuff. Oh, um, thank you. So this um, is a, a piece from The Verge about this this new podcast venture called Luminary, which is aiming to be one one part podcast app where you can you know listen to the shows that you listen to now, uh, and one part exclusive publisher of premium uh, uh, podcast. So you would pay them a subscription fee to get access to their new original shows from other people who are making podcasts that people like, but not those podcasts because those are existing podcasts. Oh, wow. So, so it's a, uh, okay. So podcasting in general tends to be a free for all of RSS feeds, but this is like a walled garden within a good podcast app. So you have the ability to like, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we, we maybe we would list I, I guess you can subscribe to both after talk and or, or after things and weird things sure well so i guess a, a similar analog which i'm surprised this article actually didn't mention is like stitcher stitcher has exclusive premium podcasts and you get them by by subscribing to stitcher and you get them in the stitcher app but stitcher also has a directory of all the other podcasts um and so it, it would be it would be in that same vein right of of uh, d producing original uh, premium podcasts, huh? So That's... they they basically want to be a best in class app, a best in class free podcast app that you are listening to all your favorite podcasts, and then all of a sudden, and actually, it just happened. I didn't know what Luminary was, but I was listening to a podcast today. Uh, I think it was the Bill Simmons podcast, and he's like, "Oh, we're doing uh, one of their shows, Binge Mode. They're doing a, a Luminary exclusive thing where they're they went through." 15 movies from the year 1999 and so now this like old movie review show is going to do a specific multi-episode deep dive into one fascinating year in movie history and that will now be exclusive to luminary, to luminary. man for the record 1999 was an extraordinary oh, yeah. year for cinema <laughs> right. it was amazing Look, i i, I so. go i i always fight that it's it's the best. I, I, I agree. Uh, what a, a, a lot of them similar themes: American Beauty, uh, Fight Club, The Matrix. Uh, probably doesn't hurt that that's the year I quit my day job and decided <laughs> to be a magician. <laughs> and all of the movies were about doing exactly that. <laughs> so the other the other part of this news story is that um, as a part of their app launch, the New York Times and their family of podcasts, as well as Spotify's family of podcasts, because they just bought Anchor, they just bought uh, Gimlet. Um, yeah. have asked Luminary to not list their podcasts in that app, in their Luminary app. Um, wait, uh, but they, they can't ask that if it's just a public-facing RSS feed, right? But if, if uh, So I don't know if Luminary will let you manually input RSS or if Luminary has its own directory. And they could ask to not be in the directory. or Because uh, otherwise they could... Because Luminary are, is inserting, their whole point is they're inserting their own ads. Ah, got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, there is there is a an ad supported version and they want to do, you know, listening data, right? That's what a lot of these app uh uh based premium uh services want also is your listening data. Oh, wow. So this is this is actually kind of close to what I was kind of half joking about is um, you know, would would you take a free version of Netflix if the only cost was your webcam had to be turned on and facing you? The entire time you're watching that's kind sure. of exactly this sure. so what they're doing yeah, is no, Stitcher does the same like thing. from a content producer it's like hey can we put your thing will you can we put your thing exclusively here part of it can be hey this thing you boy free can we put it here and put ads on it that you don't get money from or can we give us you know can we i mean it's you know from the content side is where uh, Justin and I have had this conversation forever. We keep talking about it. everybody tries to come up with, now our podcast app is going to be there looking at the podcast pie and going, how do I get that money? And it's like the one, one thing is like, well, if everybody uses our app, we can put our own ads in there. And this is a model that's been tried and tried. And now they're like, oh, and we're going to offer subscription. Right. Been done. And no, we're going to, and they're doing then a la carte, pay eight bucks a month. And it's the same problem with YouTube Red and these other systems, though. It's like, great. I think Bill Simmons' share of the pie and Trevor Noah's share of the pie and Lena Dunham, they're going to get a different deal than, you know, we are. And, and that you start dividing up that like, oh, well, you get this much per listen or whatever. Well, is that really where you want to go? Well, and, and it's also ultimately you're building your platform on paying other big names to do exclusive content, which is a risky proposition because you ultimately are they're going to be there as long as the, the money is there 
to pay yep. them to do it. And see, the uh, see Vessel. Out. Sure, Vessel was like that. Go90, I think, was doing deals, but that was like Verizon mm -hmm. backed. Yeah. It's, it's what? Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, please, please, please. Uh, you know, I, I think as a consumer, because, I, you know, I, I mean, I think we all listen to a good number of podcasts. Um, I, if there was something really interesting uh, and, and, and something that I heard that I was, w would draw me to the service, right? I, I would, I would, I would subscribe to a luminary if I knew there, there were shows there that I liked. But I think one of the problems with all of these original programmings is that they can't latch onto the existing podcasts that are already very popular. They have to get those personalities to make new shows and, and and like you said, it's it's risky, and and you don't. You're, you're, I I wouldn't. I would be fine with multiple apps. That I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I'm I would be fine with multiple apps the same way that I'm fine with having Netflix and a Hulu app and an HBO app. You know. What was the? Because I just looked at there and I saw Lena Lena Don I'm like, what was? She was part of some other like launch of something else that was going to do these like exclusive group of shows and stuff. And then I it, think that was Slate. Yeah, the Slate, yeah, Slate and, was going to get big into that, you and, know, and, and I'm they, sure she has a huge audience and put it on her, but it was like, I looked at that, I'm like, well, this is like the go-to of like, oh, who do we get? Like, oh, we like Trevor Noah, let's have Trevor Noah do anything. We like so-and-so, we're going to do this. You know, and the model was kind of like serious with, with Howard Stern back in the day, was they paid Howard Stern this humongous amount of money to say goodbye to his regular radio audience, which was controversial, I, I'll, you know. I'll tell you what, man, uh, that decision, like at the time, it was like, well, he won, he won and he got all the yep. money. And now I'm just like, can't believe he took that deal. Can't believe he gave up everything he had for just a mere $150 million. Uh, I mean, he kind of, but uh, the, the, the key for him was how do I throttle back for max money for less days? Right. That was really ultimately like he does like two shows a week now uh, uh, and nobody cares. And like there's nothing that anybody can do about it. Uh, so that's his his thing is like, all right, I'll, I'll get paid like I was still at the top of my game, but I'll just work less. And and, you know, maybe he would have gotten that deal on radio. But, you know, terrestrial radio is such a famously weird and cheap world uh, i i i doubt it but i don't know i i i i tend to think that extra content is great it, extra content can motivate me the right extra content can motivate me to pay money uh it has certainly been a boon for for me like you know for example with the with the px3 podcast we uh uh you know the Mueller report drops on thursday my regular podcast is on uh wednesday then that means that people at the three dollar level that get the Friday Minnesota and the Monday Minnesota will have two cracks of a very very hot news story where they otherwise would not. You know, by the time that Wednesday comes around again, uh, there will be barely a mention of of, of the Mueller report. So what? it's like timeliness, uh, uh, more of a deep dive, extra kind of content. I think that that's there. The question is, how do you get it to people? And that's why to, uh, you know. The smartest thing I have seen in podcasting has been Patreon's custom RSS feeds, and yep. I'm blown away that people have not ripped that off more because the, the ability to import it wherever you want is just so crucial. And I, I think the uh, the other part of, of the Luminary, the app side of it, is that they want it to be uh, kind of a very heavy recommendation thing. So something where, like when the Mueller report, that they, they actually reference it in this article, if we had had the app launched when the Mueller report we would have for people who were interested in politics. We would have a, a marquee at the top and you would get recommended episodes of recent content like like a politics or, or what have you. So they're basically creating uh, a an analog to the YouTube algorithm for recommendations where sure. it's like, look, we, we see what you're watching. You probably almost certainly are very, very interested in this. Right. Which, which I think will be tough because I know with YouTube there's a lot of, of – jumping around, right? I don't really care what channel something's on, if it's an interesting title and a thumbnail and all right. that stuff. Like I like uh, think pieces about Rick and Morty. Sure. And they're like, oh, here's another one. And that's what that, yeah. Brand name I don't care about. Where with, with podcasts, you know, at least for me, it's tough for me to even give something a try because it's oh. like, 
because it's like, oh, well, I have to download uh, an episode or I have to subscribe to get an episode and then and I'm sitting in my thing and am I even going to listen to it? And they're long. Podcasts are generally, you know, a, you know, I, all the ones we do are an hour plus. I I think that's it's a big part of it. Like, I had this conversation that I think it did with you, Justin, was we're talking about how you recommending a podcast isn't the same as, hey, watch this six minute YouTube video. You 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 need to make it granular where episode recommend episodes. Some podcast apps and stuff are trying to get more granular, like, oh, listen to this part of this podcast. But that assumes somebody goes out there and makes it granular. With this model, like, I don't I mean, I, I don't know anything, but I know that the hey, pay that one price, get everything is a content creator. It's great for books that I've had out there for a couple of years that aren't getting pushed as much, and I put them into like Kindle Unlimited. It's Kindle Unlimited's wonderful, but for brand new releases and things like that, it's the last place I want to put them because I have an audience that will pay me or will pay full price or close to that. And like with Justin's yeah. extra content, it's like, do you, do I say, oh, go go over to this other service which I make a tiny amount from, or use Patreon? Like we said, Patreon's been brilliant sure i bet i think this... oh bring them old dollars over to daddy <laughs> yeah. see the, yeah the patreon model is such a good uh, a good avenue for small and medium-sized creators that i think this luminary stuff and with with a lot of these other you know stitcher and 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 spotify also going into premium content and subscription services i think they're only aiming for big name podcasters who would never make a patreon and would have to rely on ads and ads are you know, fickle and, and they come and go. And if you know, oh, they're at, they're ordering me, they're making an order for, you know, six months of, of some concept and they'll pay me up front or they'll pay me, you know, in advance or something, then I think that's where that works. But for, for you know, the people listening to this show for creative advice, you know, even we would not I, really be at that table or at that I discussion. think, and again, this is another chime in for a uh, good job, good going Patreon. Like uh, the night attack um, model, I think really lands in terms of there being an honesty to what you're getting. Yes, you cross the threshold into paying literally anything and now you double the amount of time we get to hang out because sure. we're aware that what we're doing is we're uh, enjoying our one-way friendship and uh, uh, and hanging out with you at the gym, at the bar, on your drive, or whatever. And so you currently get for free an hour and change mm -hmm. of, of time with us. Now you get double that. Uh, sure. We are very clear that it is um, rockier uh, uh, co uh, uh, content in the pre-show and the after show, but uh, it is a fact that we are hanging out with you longer, and uh, sometimes the very best stuff happens in there. Sure. Um, that but if you're like, like a something... radio lab where you're a very highly produced show, it's hard to scale in that same way. Correct. Because then it's like, oh, this is a really good episode. Is it too good for us to put behind the wall? Should we right. have that be a public facing or a private facing thing? And uh, I like the fact that we don't have to face that with the current uh, Patreon thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't I know that like where Netflix is gone is, you know, Netflix was an alternative to. You couldn't watch the things that were on Netflix elsewhere for free legally. You know, you you it was another destination. Things could go from box office to home video to Netflix or whatever. And then Netflix said, you know, let's just start producing our own stuff. And it's it's an you know a model that's hard to apply with podcasts. Producing a TV show or movie is expensive. You know, and and it's it takes a Netflixized entity to do several of them well. Producing a podcast, even a quality podcast, you know, I'm sitting with three people here who do a really good job of produce quad podcasts as good a quality as anything I'm going to see on Luminary. And the problem is, is that, I don't know, they're like, yeah, we're going to go get these big names here and we're going to pay them big checks to get them on board. Wonderful. I don't know if they're going to consistently have the quality of, you know, a modern rogue or, you know, politics, politics, politics or whatever. Um, you know, uh, there's a, a streaming platform that I'm not going to name that we might be streaming on now, theoretically, <laughs> that uh, very much doesn't believe in out and out paying for content like the Pornhub famous, <laughs> famous people to come and just sort of stream like they're they're always interested in trying to get people to do it. But ultimately, they've recognized that you can pay a outlet like let's say pay a BuzzFeed to say, all right, could open up your channel and th they'll take that cash and uh, they'll they'll buy you know they'll hire a bunch of people and they'll 
do a bunch of things. They'll have their runway for two months. And then when that money runs out, they'll come back to the platform and say, cool, look at these numbers we got. Wait, another check, please. Yeah. And at a certain point, you're just giving that mouse a cookie forever and hoping that there's runway that at some point they're like, oh, we're making so much money on this channel. We won't have to ask for a check. But spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. They're always going to have they're always going to want to ask for a check because you're building their platform. There, there's a similar dynamic going on kind of within games, pu public relations right now in terms of giving instead of giving stuff to outlets and, and, and uh, uh, you know, proper, proper channels to review games and preview games, whatever, to just give them to influencers or to fans and to have them stream it on Twitch uh, because it's cheaper. And because those those people are usually more more. Um, I don't know, more likely to say nice things about a free thing that they were They're given. more enthusiastic about and, the free game they just got. Right. And um, it, it, it's and, and I think in the podcasting world, I, mean, I know that there, there are tons of huge podcasts and very, you know, big heavy hitters. But I think there's also such a large population of small and medium sized creators that I, 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 I don't know, man. It's 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 tough. It's like having public access and Netflix on the same ch TV channel. I, yeah, yeah, that's I, a good way to think, put it. Here's here's the biggest thing, and and to go back to something you said a little earlier, Bryce. Mm -hmm. I don't care about your recommendations for me, podcast wise. Like for me, the, to get on a podcast, I need like one of five people I know and trust <laughs> rave about a thing, and only then, after I dismiss them twice, will the third time. I'd be like, okay, sure, uh, I'll I'll try it, and then I'll either like it or I won't. Like my finicky tastes for like, like what I'm going to try and what I'm going to enjoy is so specific that I almost immediately reject somebody else. You know, uh, just or uh, God forbid, an algorithm spitting something as personal as as a podcast. Yeah, you know, some of them the way they want to work is what your friend they're gonna they want to have, have the social aspect. I think Lumer does it too. Like your friends like this, and that that increases the likelihood of like mm -hmm. oh I'll check this out. But I want to I want to make a little point. Sure. You look at like when like we're talking about oh yeah we went to those content creators we got them to create the stuff and you know we got that budget we got that twenty million dollars to spend on getting people onto our platform which everybody does and thinks is a great idea but it's like well they make them stay. You know, BuzzFeed, you know, BuzzFeed was one of those brands that like, let's go pay BuzzFeed to go bring BuzzFeed in here. Whose videos get more views on average, BuzzFeed or I'm looking at the stats right here, the modern rogue. Go on. You know, uh, the buzz, answer I, is, buzz, I don't I think on average, modern rogue videos get more views. Wow. You know, well, but the, 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 uh, I, and and that does make sense if we're talking about in average because uh, BuzzFeed can be very hot and very cold. Uh, yeah. uh, and BuzzFeed has a lot of different arms, right? Like they have a big main channel that's all the big stuff but then right. they have smaller ancillary lifestyle channels right? whereas whereas yeah. uh and i guess the same could be said with uh with scam nation scam nation has always been a feast and famine kind of thing where sure. it's like it either does 40 or fifty thousand or you know millions of views right, uh right, and right. oftentimes not much in the middle whereas modern rogue is every release a uh, hundred thousand people show up in lockstep and it's like we have to go out of our way with something very weird or off brand to not get that hundred thousand to show up mm -hmm. and i and my point is that you're an operation that is you've got a good team you know a good group of people there you've been in it for a while you're a small operation, you know. You're you're a what a three person team that does this stuff. Uh, f uh closer to five Four nowadays. Or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so BuzzFeed a lot more. BuzzFeed Video. Uh, BuzzFeed Video is is a minor cable station. Okay? okay, and and I'm saying in the content things when people are like Luminary going like, who are we gonna part? We're gonna go find the BuzzFeeds because it's got the brand name and all that consistently. It's not as much value, you know, like, you know, and I can see if you're going to bring in a PewDiePie or somebody who is really big, but also you don't get PewDiePie in a world of luminary or this is I understand it or Spotify is doing the same thing. These people mm -hmm. don't bubble up. And the problem is, is that you then go to people who are like and like uh, I'm a, they, they brought in a certain cable personality who are like, oh, we all love this person. Guess what? I've seen their numbers. You know what? I can name, you know, there's a thousand podcasters I can name right now who cover news and politics who get more viewers, maybe a couple hundred, you know, they get more viewers than this person does on their cable show. Sure. Well, and that's that's yeah. the trouble with with trying to sell people on pocket. Like like Justin was saying, you know, uh, 
for for especially people who are new to podcasts or maybe aren't even interested in podcasts, knowing that there's a show from Trevor Noah or Karama from Queer Eye or from Lena Dunham will get them interested in it in this service on the name alone or uh they've got uh, the planet money guy here the how i built this guy doing original shows and so that's that's they're going for big names because it's hard to sell people on something long form like this that you can't easily make like teasers or now, i i will say that there's tremendous value in that usage data that is largely untapped um there was a darknet diaries episode where um uh, where, where where he was utterly aghast at how soft the Apple iTunes uh, podcast charts are. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he he never quite got to the real number. It, like He was just amazed that, that, that you could buy top placement or, or being in the top, whatever. Sure. But what, what he never got to was the realization that, that just uh, in a heavily fragmented market, not everyone uses the Apple uh, podcast app. And as a result, right. Yes, they do track that stuff, but they are a minor player in that big, wide space. And there is no way. So all these people who are quoting their in terms you know, of in terms of players or directories. Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, for 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 the directories uh, or the the top lists is generated like current people, current real time number of new subscriptions, people hitting mm -hmm. that subscribe button. There, uh, uh, think about like you get to hit that subscribe button once, and then it lives forever and ever and ever. And if you don't use the Apple podcast app, then your vote never even gets logged on it. So it's not wild that that somebody in Indonesia is spending uh, half an hour clicking subscribe on multiple accounts mm -hmm. and that you show up in the top 10 because you went, you know, because if you have 300 new subscribers in an hour, then congratulations, you're a top 10 podcast in all of uh, 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 Apple iTunes. Yes. So but likewise, uh, all of uh, I, I think you use eyecatcher just out of inertia. That's the, the app I use. Um, mm -hmm. I think about how many, every time I sync and podcasts are downloaded, there's no way for them to ever know which of these I ever listened to. And, and there right. are, there's gigabytes of data that I will never, never get to, but it shows up as a listener review, even though like there are many podcasts that I've gotten angry at, but not so angry as to unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. So, so they continue to download and they continue to report those numbers. Sure. And uh, so as a result, I think that there is a place for something like the luminary app to, to take advantage of like actual user data, um, but 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 it sounds to me like they're complicating it unnecessarily to well, with, with this 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 walled garden thing. I mean, but but I think that's they're they're basically just doing a fancier version of what Stitcher has done, even down to the idea that you know Stitcher was controversial five years ago, seven years ago for uh, dynamically inserting ads into RSS feeds that you would or, or rather like. Because they own the player, mm -hmm. they would jam an ad in between you, like, you know, your show ending and then another show beginning. So people would get upset that it's like, oh, well, my show ends and the next thing you know, there's an ad I don't get paid for. And well, that was Stitcher, mm -hmm. you know, applying their their Stitcher tax. So uh, I don't know. Um, I fare thee well. I hope that there is uh, the, the idea that there's more money coming into the business of podcasting is a good idea that's awesome uh because that's the funniest part to go back to something andrew said initially uh when when the big company comes in and gets the vc funding and they're like yep how can we get in on all the money being made in podcasts it's like ha ha fools the chest is empty <laughs> like there is no money in podcasting congratulations you are the big money in podcasting how can we get you oh, well, you know, it's it's a it's a strange thing too, because like I, there they had an interview with the founder here, and he mentioned he threw out this quote, which was, um, you know, like right now Spotify plans to invest five hundred million in podcasting. They clearly want to own a big part of it, um, right? I mean, they bought know. they bought Anchor and Gimlet to big big podcasting uh, services slash uh, publishers. Yeah, and they want to take it seriously, which is something that another a company, which shall remain nameless, which has had a tremendous interest and has effect, de facto owned podcasting and also has a massive streaming service, uh, does not seem to care about podcasting or to uh, have that, those kind of analytics integrate into what you uh, are, are listening to. 
Yeah. In the case of a company like Apple, for example, you know, they don't make any money on podcast app. You know, they don't put ads in there. They don't do anything. It's a thing they create as a service. And that's why it is part of, part of the reason why there's just no data. It's like they're not incentivized well, to figure out. Uh, well, though, they, 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 added, they, they finally added a, a, a data portal right. like a year ago. Uh, a couple years ago, they I, iTunes tried started gathering some data uh, from the people using uh, uh, I guess people using the podcast app so that you can yeah, have I, I got, let me clarify stuff. because Apple doesn't make any money on it. They've got three engineers working on that. Well, <laughs> you know, okay. it's, it's, it's not like Google's YouTube monetization arm and whatever. Like they're, they're just, yeah, they change the way it does. And because the, I use their podcast app all the time and they have a certain lot of, they do have data, but they're not, it's, it's like Apple books, you know, like iBooks, like, Oh, we're going to books. I'm like, great. Like, yeah, we're going to have this team over here do it and whatever. We don't care. And then you're like, wow, looks like you guys don't really care. Because it's not an iPhone, um, so Luminary, the guy, the the head of Luminary, made a con said the entire podcast industry has only spent ten million on advertising. I was like, how do you, uh, how do you quantify that? <laughs> you know, how do you? I don't know. So uh, these are podcasters buying ads on other podcasts. No, he says spending money uh, he on says how podcast. he's confident because they just got a hundred million dollar round of invest. He's like, it's only spent 10 million advertising, build an audience of 62 million listeners. You know, that's how many people listen to podcasts, you know, and he's like, oh, if we spend X more money on it, think of how big it will all be, you know, so hmm. about, about, you know, how they're going to do like big, they're doing big ad buys for Luminary to promote, you know, that's his whole thing is, um, which feels understandable because for as much as podcasting doesn't make Apple money, podcasting doesn't make podcasters a lot of money except for, you know, the very top, you know, anchor shows of various networks and that I But I guess my point is that he's using this weird metric to say like I don't know how many times have I promoted or we talked about promoted podcasts and all that to to equate to like you spend 10 million to promote a movie and you get this return, you know, like there's only 10 million have been spent on promoting podcasting. Look how big it's well. Let's count all the hours and all the, it's just, it's just a weird, I am saying it's, it's a very startup CEO metric to show this is why we're different because this is, it's like, well, that's, doesn't really, you know, that's not, it's, it, it doesn't have 62 million listeners in podcasting because somebody spent $10 million to promote it. Yeah. I know. So anyhow, um, gentlemen, any picks? Uh, yeah. Uh, my, my pick. Oh, I had it all picked out, so to speak. I'll, I'll pick. I'll pick my podcast app that I like, Castro. It's a paid podcast app, but I like it. It uh, automatically downloads the episodes that I want into a playlist uh, that I can then order. And uh, I don't know. I like the interface. It's I've cool. uh, I've seen this. Is this? Uh, how how long have you been using Castro? About a year. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Um, because I think Castro has. Uh, maybe uh, uh 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 keep talking about Castro. I I may be thinking of something. I else. think it's great. Hey <laughs> friends, uh, Justin Robert Young for Castro. Uh, uh, you love podcasts? Me too. Download them the way I download them, Castro style. Uh, head on over to www.justinlovescastro.biz slash dot co dot uk. Never mind. I must be thinking of something else. <laughs> uh, I use I use Overcast. Overcast is great. Uh, I pay. It, it it has a premium feature, which I do pay for. It's like a couple dollars a year or something. Um, but they also will let me upload files, so I can upload audio files, and it will show up alongside my podcast it's got the smart speed thing where instead of speeding up um the sound of everything it'll try to cut out silences um, but it will have speed stuff it's got voice boost so if you're listening to someone who maybe doesn't have the best uh equalizing or compression it will kind of normalize stuff uh you can set up you know automated lists so i have a playlist of like all the work stuff that i've got and then a playlist of all the stuff that i listen to in my free time and uh it's it's pretty it's, I, it's pretty nice i like that overcast yeah nice I use iCatcher. What I like about it is I haven't had to install it ever uh, because I got it once like 10 years ago, and that's where all my podcasts are. Uh, it's it's fine. They're all fine. Whatever. Um, I My pick is uh, Tesla's Navigate by Autopilot mode. Um, it's kind of really awesome. Driving down the highway. You've got destination, little option says this, do you want to do this? You double click and the car drives and changes lanes and does it all for you. And you get to where you want to go. 
been fun. Really like it. Yeah, that's um. Wasn't there a big news story about uh, about the price of autopilot going up? Yeah, I he they did a thing where they dropped autopilot down to like like two grand, and I just I had I it was the one I had uh, the full self driving thing or whatever the upgrade was. Oh. But anyhow, like I I have the full package for it, whatever, and it's it's nice to be and one it's nice to be on the highway and one just autopilot's been great for just staying in your lane and now what it'll do is it'll be like hey do you want to turn here and you can either say confirm to let it change lanes or you can say nah i trust you you change lanes when you need to yeah uh, we're seeing and, a video here of of uh i guess the full auto or the full self driving in in city i didn't realize that they had city driving i thought it was only highway uh, that highway oh, yeah. navigation assist like you were talking about yeah i've been using it in 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 city stuff uh I don't. This one they show like stopping at stop signs and stuff. That's coming, but I haven't. That I don't have that. That's not out yet. Oh, I see. Um, but it's kind of amazing. It's a different kind of driving. It really is cool. It's pretty cool. So if you're looking at a new car, take a look. Take a look. I'd say you know go to a Tesla showroom, but it's hard to know this week if they're going to be there. Or they're going to go online and they're going to decide they're going to go back to showrooms. I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, great product. Crazy company. Yeah. It's been. Woo. Alrighty, uh, Brian. Brian stepped out to go get the kids, so we we timed that. Yeah. Uh, question is, how do they handle rain or snow? Go look at uh, reports online from people. They'll talk about it. Um, you know, it needs to be able to see where the lines of the roads are. But I've used it in different weather conditions, and it's been fine for me. It's still a thing. You want to watch and keep doing it. But what's nice is, um, uh, you know. The collision avoidance is great, and other cars have that too. A lot of these features are, you know, they're not just Tesla's not the only one that has them, but it is, it is a different kind of. It's one of these things where, you know, my, my fellow Tesla owners, it's like, once you get one, if you have to go rent a car or something else, you don't want to use it. It's like if you've got a computer you really like, you know, and if you, you know, going from a, an iPhone or an Android back to a basic regular phone that doesn't have those functions is like, ugh. So. Oh, Castos. I was thinking of Castos. What's that? Uh, it's a podcast hosting uh, service, and they have uh, a, a WordPress plugin kind of similar to PowerPress. That's oh. What yeah, I was looking at Castro. So Castro is like 10 bucks a year or whatever for this now? or No, it was a one-time payment, at least when I bought it. It's not now. Oh, really? Yeah, it's uh -huh. free with in-app purchases now. So you maybe got... Yeah, uh, $3 quarterly or 10 bucks for the year. I I think that's a great model for some products. For some other product products, I think it's stupid and predatory and annoying. Mm -hmm. You know, I've 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 yeah. avoided certain things now because they've I've had certain products, oh we're doing the subscription model. I'm like, I'm not using you anymore because I've used I use your app once every couple you know, three months and Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's I I I use Overcast all the time, so I feel good about it. Plus, it's still only it's it really is only like two or three bucks a year, um, and knowing that like you know I can not have to deal with ads and know that like uh, 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 Marco, the guy who's the developer for Overcast, is constantly doing updates. He's got you know Marco Ament. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, yeah. He's doing you know Apple Watch stuff and CarPlay stuff, and you know he's a very active developer and. Um, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. So I can I actually see sort of the app developing in real time. Um, and and I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, let's see what their in-app purchase is. Overcast Premium, what does that mean? So it's um, like uh, ad-free, and it used to be like that was how you got the dark theme, but now that's free. It's, it's you get you get some online storage, so you can, I think you upload files that'll show up in your in your account that you can listen Apparently to. Apparently I installed it at one point. Huh. Um but yeah, it's uh it's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, the podcast player wars thus have begun. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean look, it, uh, uh, I have no problem with there being a pay thing and even subscription uh, uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with, but it's like you better be worth that money. Sure. Because this is a commoditized field, like with uh, eighty, you know, eighty percent of them uh, have all the same features, and mm -hmm. because it, uh, you know, you, you're you're herding free RSS feeds, mostly, right? You know, everyone's got the same product, 
and and you know it's 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 very tough with podcasting to offer people something that is ad free because so many podcasts burn in their ads and if the, the ad free you're offering them is something that people can already get ad free in any number of apps you know it's a tough environment to take advantage of that uh, that structure when you know it was built fundamentally a different way mm-hmm. so um Alrighty, well, that's going to do it here for us uh, for Weird Things. We'll be back in a few hours with Cord Killers. Justin, you said you're done for the day. Uh, Andrew, you got any streams you're thinking of, thinking of cooking up? I'm going to try to pop on and do a Periscope. I haven't talked about the Thriller Award nomination yet, oh, so I'd like nice. to do that. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Very cool. At Andrew Main on Twitter for that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'll yeah. be back here on uh, Twitch.tv slash Night Attack with, uh, uh, with Cord Killers in a little bit. I think we're going to have Nicole Lee on, fan, a favorite of the show. Um, but until then, we'll see you guys later. See ya!